I want you to do a little something. We're gonna dance a little bit. We're gonna sing, get up out of that grave. We want you to move a little bit. We want you to shake a little bit. All right, let's declare. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave.
So I just want to take this time. I want you to reflect how good your God is to you. I want you to reflect how much that he's had his hand on your life. How much he's brought you out of situations. And let's just take this moment and just praise our God and give him glory and give him honor. And, and not pass up this opportunity to let the rocks cry out more than us today. Can we do that? Can we sing this? It's your breath, it's your breath.
Hey, before uh, everybody goes, Harlan and Shelby and Caitlin and Sydney, if you guys would join me up here real quick. <laughs> Maniacal laugh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> here you go. Come on down here so everybody can see you. Come on down here. Hey, we just wanted to take the opportunity, yes, to thank you guys for all that you've done. <clears throat> Over this last year, uh, after Pastor Mike left, these, these four especially really stepped up to make sure that Legacy Church continues to run. And yeah, not only, not only did they continue to do the things that they were already doing, such as taking care of the kids and the youth and the eye serve and all that, they all took on extra responsibilities, extra things to make sure that Sunday mornings continued to still happen to make sure that that there was somebody who was filling the pulpit every Sunday there was somebody up here preaching many of them I'm sure spoke probably for the first time over the last year and God stretched them and grew them during this time and I am so honored to be working along beside them and and I know <laughs> I know that God has used them in new ways over this last year and when we met uh, a week and a half ago, we had all of them over and we're talking to them. I want you guys to know as the pastor of this church that, that these four are also pastors of this church. That, that Harlan and Shelby are not just youth pastors. Caitlin is not just children's pastor. Sydney is not just the ISERV pastor and leader. But they are pastors of Legacy Church as a whole. And so as much as, as, as I appreciate all of you who have honored me and, and done things for us, I want to make sure that I honor them and that we as a church honor them as well. And so just wanted to take a couple minutes to thank them for that. To, to show our appreciation, but also I wanted to let you guys know, I know we had talked about it, but wanted to let you know officially, um, they're going to be taking a couple weeks off over the next couple months through the rest of the summer, because as they've done <laughs> so much, <laughs> to give them some time to rest, to refresh, so, so each one of them over the next couple months are going to be taking a couple Sundays off in a row, so if you don't see Harlan and Shelby up here leading worship. If you don't see Caitlin over in kids, they're not mad. They're not leaving. <laughs> they're not like, okay, Matt's here. We're out. <laughs> they're just taking some time to, to refresh. They may be here. They may be somewhere else on those Sunday mornings, but we want to give them that opportunity to refresh, to recharge, to, to let God just minister to them during this time and also so that when we're ready to to kick back into high gear for the school year and i i feel like god has laid some things on our hearts and and things that we're going to be kicking back off when the school year starts that they're ready to go they're refreshed and they're ready for that so just one more time um thank you guys so much for everything you've done you guys are awesome and we just appreciate it and we honor you guys as pastors of the church so thank you so much for all that you've done <laughs> So, first of all, I get beard bored every once in a while is what I call it. Get a little bored with the beard. People have looked at me. They're like, what's wrong with your face today? I shaved off most of my beard is what it is. I do, in fact, have cheeks. I used to have a jawline, but that was like 30 pounds ago. Um, so, it's just kind of all neck right now. But, uh, and you'll probably never find out if I have a chin or not. This never comes off. Um, yeah, we get bored. And uh, I get bored with my beard. Crystal, you'll find out as you get to know her, her hair changes every month or so. looks completely different. And I don't have that option up here, so it changes here instead. So, uh, yeah, lots of things. Hey, we are super excited about the, a couple things coming up, especially the baptisms. I've had a couple people this last week ask me about getting baptized. And so we're, we're excited to do that. If you or somebody you know, kids, grandkids, friends, um, want to be baptized, sign up for that. I'll be in touch with you over the next couple weeks. Uh, like Sydney said, I just want to make sure that everybody who's baptized that Sunday understands what it is and what we're doing and the meaning of that. And so we're really excited about doing that. That'll be in just the 1045 service 
on July 9th, I believe is that date. And so we really encourage you guys, if you're getting baptized, if you have you know family, make sure you're there and let's make that a celebration with those who are being baptized because that is a huge, huge thing that uh, we're excited to be doing um, in a couple weeks on that. So, hey, as we get ready to um, next Sunday, we're going to be kicking off. I know I, I came in and spoke about... Uh, the, the Valley of Dry Bones and Ezekiel and, and that sort of thing kind of laid out the, you know, the story, how it goes, the bones, the body, and the breath, and how that affects us and where we're going over the next six months. It's actually, as I've been writing it out and really studying and praying, going to be a little bit more than six months, but we'll get there. Um, we're going to really kick that off next Sunday in, in the month of July and start talking about what that means, what that looks like for us as a church um, but I wanted to share with you guys just one more kind of what I'd call a one-off <laughs> sermon. You know, not really part of a series, but as I've been reading and praying this week, really felt like this was important to, to share with you um, as we get ready to go into this next phase as a church. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 4. So 2 Kings comes right after 1 Kings. Good, you got it. <laughs> So 2 Kings chapter 4, Kings, my dad, my kids always laugh because when he's preaching, he says Kings, doesn't pronounce the G. <laughs> so they're always like, it's Kings, uh, King. So 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 1 says this. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all, except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and all your sons can live on what is left over. This is an amazing miracle. And I, I love this story for so many reasons. First of all, this lady who, who her husband was one of the, what they called the school of prophets. Elijah, Elisha's mentor, had started this group that basically they were training ministers, training prophets, men, men who had been called into the ministry. And he began to teach them and school them. And then Elisha carried that on. And so one of these men, one of these students had passed away. We don't know how, don't know what happened, but his widow was left. And I just think, man, what, a, what an awful situation. You're doing what you feel like is right. You're doing what you feel like God has called you to do. This man had been following God. He'd been following the prophet of the Lord. And then he dies. And he leaves behind a, a wife and two sons. And in that day and age, if you had debts, the way they would do it, if you couldn't pay your debt, they came and got you and put you in prison until you could pay off that debt. I don't really know how that worked. <laughs> you know, how do you pay off a debt when you're in prison? But you would work for that person, basically, and, and you, would, you would pay off. And so these, these debtors, these creditors were coming to get her sons, threatening to take them if she could not pay off that debt. And as a widow, if you lost your sons, you were in a bad state because you couldn't work. In that day and time, a, a woman couldn't norm, normally go out and get a job. And so she would have been in this terrible state. And she comes to Elisha. She comes to the prophet. And she cries out to him, help us, help us. She comes to him to fix her problem. <laughs> Oftentimes, when things happen to us, when things are bad, when things go wrong, how do you respond in that moment? How do you respond to what's happening around you? Do you immediately go to somebody else to fix your problem or do you stop to look at what has God already given me 
And oftentimes, when, when instead of looking to others, oftentimes God has already provided the answer to our problems. We just haven't recognized it. We just haven't realized that it's already there. And so this woman comes to, to Elisha, and I love Elisha's response. He says, how can I help you? And he doesn't say, you know what, we're going to get all the other prophets together, and we're going to take up an offering, we're just going to bless you with it. He doesn't say, hey, I'm, I'm, I've got some extra money set back. I'm just going to pay that debt for you. He asks her, what do you have in your house? And I think as Christians, so many times we go to the prophet. <laughs> we go to the pastor. We go to our parents. We go to all these other people. When What God is asking when you're facing a problem, when you're facing a mountain in your life, when you're facing something that you have no control over, oftentimes God's question to you is, what do you have in your house? And the first thing that this lady says is, nothing. Nothing at all. And, and that's our response a lot of times to God is, I got nothing. Like, I can't, I can't sing like they can sing. I can't play the guitar. I can't preach. I can't do all these things. I, I've got nothing at all, God. And it's like almost an afterthought. She says, I, I guess I've got this little flask of olive oil. That's all I've got. But what good is that? What good is that going to do me in this situation? And the first thing that we have to learn from this scripture is the most important thing is to be available to God. It's to be available no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter what it is that you think you have. When you make those things available to God, God does something amazing with it. Every single time. It reminds me of the story when Jesus feeds the 5,000. I think it's in uh, the book of John that he says that there's all of these people and it's 5,000 men plus women and children. So probably more like 20,000 people. And, and Jesus Again, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, how are we going to feed all these people? And he says, what? What do you have? <laughs> what do you have? You feed them. And so they scour the whole thing and they come back with this one little kid who has five loaves of bread and like two fish. You're telling me in 20,000 people, this boy was the only one that packed a picnic? <laughs> like you can't tell me there weren't other people that had food out there, right? Right? There weren't other people that as the disciples were walking around saying, hey, how much food do you have? How much food do you have? And they were like, uh -uh, this is my food. Like if they didn't think to bring food, that's on them. This is my food. This is what I brought. But think about that boy. He said, man, my mom made me pack this food. It's more than I can eat. You know, I'll, I'll gladly share it. I don't know what it's going to do, but I'm going to make it available to the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to make it available to what God wants. Whatever he wants to do, no matter how big or how small it may seem, I don't see any way how these five loaves of, fish and, or five loaves of bread and two fish are going to feed 20,000 people, but God, you can have it. Think about the miracle that happened because he made it available to God. <laughs> how good he had to feel when he was standing there and saw all that. He was like... That was my bread. <laughs> those two fish, those were my fish. I brought those. Jesus prayed over those and look, it fed all these people. And everybody else that missed out on partaking in that miracle because they were selfish and they were holding on. Like think about this widow in that moment when she said, I, I've got a flask of olive oil. And that was it. Like she had to think, I don't know what good is, but this is all I've got. Like I'm not, what do you, I can't do anything with this. I've got to hold it out. I've got to hold on to it. I've got to just pour it out, you know, drip by drip and just barely use any of it. Like she made it available and said, whatever it needs to be, that's what I'm going to do with it. Oftentimes we disqualify ourselves before we even give God the chance to use us. Oftentimes, we say, you can't use me because of this. You can't use me because of my past. You can't use me because of, of things that have happened in my life. I know in my life, the, I come from a very educated family. My, my mom and my dad, my dad was a, a college professor, has multiple master's degrees. My mom is a teacher. I've got two brothers who, are, who are, have counseling degrees, master's, another brother who's a principal. All of these people, I think I counted up one time, between my parents and my brothers, there's something like 14 college degrees between all of them and uh, and I think I've said this before the best way to describe my college experience was that I paid for some college I can't even say I went to college because I flunked 
a couple of classes because I just didn't show up. I just, you know, wasn't interested in that class and stopped going. And so in my life, that's something that I've battled. God, I don't know how you can use me. I don't have that degree. I don't have that, that formal training like so many people have. And God has had to deal with me in my life and deal with me in my own disqualification and say, I can still use you if you're available, if you're willing. What do they always say? The best ability is availability. You have to make yourself available to God regardless of what is going on. I love in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has this amazing vision of God, right? And it's the throne room, and it's the, the angels crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and this amazing thing, and here's the prophet of God who's already being used in some sense, but he, he looks and he sees God and he sees his holiness and he's like, oh man, this is bad because I'm sinful, I'm unclean, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among people of, of uncleanliness, <laughs> And then God says this in verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 says, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. As Christians, we should all have that attitude. We should all have that attitude. God, it doesn't matter what it is. If you want to use me, I'm here. Use me. It may not be what, what everybody else thinks. It may not be the best. You know, in the story of the talents of the three servants that Jesus talks about, he gave one servant ten bags, one five bags, and one one bag. You may be a one bagger. That's okay. They were all asked the same question at the end. What did you do with what I gave you? It doesn't matter if you've got ten bags or you've got one bag or you're somewhere in between. We're all going to be asked the same question. What did you do with what I gave you? Did you go out and use what I gave you to use? Are you willing to say no matter the what, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how much you have or how little you have, God, use this. Use me however you see fit. I'm available to you, all of you, regardless. The next thing you see, if you skip on to verse 3, when she, she replies, nothing at all except a flask of olive oil. Listen to what Elijah says. Borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jar, setting each one aside when it is filled. <laughs> she got, had to have been like, this is all I've got. <laughs> like, this thing and you want me to go borrow jars and those jars would have been the big water jars that each house had to go and get water from the wells or from the river wherever they were that were probably you know big big jars would hold 10 15 gallons each one and she's like I've got this little flask and you want me to pour it into this jar and borrow more than one like what what are you telling me to do this is crazy why would I do that but I love verse the next verse because it says in a verse five. So she did as she was told. Come on, husbands. That no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. This is not a not not one of those messages. <laughs> but she went ahead and and did it. So she was like, okay, like if that's what you're telling me to do, I trust you. I trust God. As crazy as it seems. I'm going to go borrow all these jars. And that couldn't have been easy. Like I said, these are big jars. They were, they, were, they were heavy. They probably had to be cleaned out. You know, they had to bring them all in. If you, if you poured oil into a jar that had water, that had other stuff in, in it, it would, it would make the oil worthless. It wouldn't be as good anymore. And so they had to clean them out. They had to fix them. They had to get them all ready to go. Think of all the work that went into this. Be willing to be a servant. Are you willing to put in the hard work? Man, it's not always going to be glamorous. Think, I mean, how many of you guys have ever worked with oil in one way or the other? I used to, 
work for, like I said, Walmart Tire and Lube, and we change oil. And I know motor oil out of an old engine isn't the same as olive oil, but it's still, when oil gets on you, it's hard to clean up, and it's on you, and it's dirty. And you think about this woman pouring this oil, and then her sons moving those jars, those big things, over and over. This was hard work. This would have taken, like, just not like a little five-minute boop, 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 boop. Like, this would have taken a while. It was hard work. Are you willing to serve? Are you willing to do something that's, that's not glamorous, <laughs> that's not going to be the best of things to do? So many times when, when uh, we were youth pastors in Joplin, we were at a church there that was part of the Pentecostal Church of God. It was kind of the biggest PCG church in the area. And Messenger College, which was the Pentecostal Church of God uh, Bible College, was right there in Joplin. So we get a lot of Messenger students that would end up over at our church. And they'd always come. They'd be like, man, I want to get involved. What can I do? You know, how can I help in, in youth? And what they were really asking is, will you hand me a microphone? Because they all had their giftings and talents. They were going to school. They all wanted to be on stage leading worship. They wanted to preach. They wanted to do all these things. And I'd always tell them the same thing. Hey, I get here on Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock to start setting up chairs. Come meet me at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> and it's amazing how many of them never showed up. <laughs> and it's amazing how many of them only showed up once. <laughs> But of those few that showed up on a regular basis and came week after week to help me, guess what? They were the ones that ended up with microphones on stage. <laughs> they were the ones that ended up getting to, to do the other things because they proved that nothing was too big or too small for them. Nothing was going to, you know, they didn't care about just having a mic. They were willing to pick up a broom. <laughs> they were willing to pick up a toilet brush. <laughs> and help clean, and do what needed to be done, regardless of what it is. I love the story in John chapter 13. They're at the Last Supper. This is it. This is the final time that Jesus has to spend with his disciples. They come in. They're all getting ready to sit down and have a meal, and, and the tradition, the, the, the customary thing is that there would be a servant that would be present that would come and wash their feet, wash the grime, because they walked around in sandals. They would have, you know, from the dirt road, from the other things on the dirt roads would be all over their feet and so it was customary for a servant to come in and wash their feet and it was a dirty job it wasn't a job that anybody wanted to do it was considered the lowest job of the household and so I can almost picture they all come in and they're all sitting down the 12 disciples and Jesus maybe there's some other people there with him and they're all like looking around like who's who's going to do it? We don't have another servant here. Like who's the lowest? Like it's got to be Thaddeus. Nobody knows Thaddeus. Like he's the extra disciple. Nobody knows anything about. Like Thaddeus, come on, you need to wash some feet here. You know, and they're all kind of looking around. Like, are you going to do it? I'm not going to do it. I don't want to touch your stinky toes, Peter. And they're all looking around trying to figure out who's going to wash feet. It says in verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God, so he got up. Think about those verses. Like that is so polar opposite of how we think of things. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything. So, because, in light of that, he got up. And he took off his robe, and he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Because he had all authority, he said, I'm going to make myself the lowest. I'm going to make myself the servant of all. You guys may not know this, and I know we've kind of talked about them already, but Harlan and Shelby and Caitlin and Sydney, they're not just doing this. <laughs> They've been cleaning the church. They've been here every week sweeping and mopping and cleaning toilets and doing all the lowly things that so many people think, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't have time for that. Being a servant, being willing to put in that hard work, when you do those things, miracles begin to happen. I love that this miracle, it didn't happen. I don't, I don't even credit Elisha with this miracle. This miracle happened in the widow's hand. 
It wasn't Elisha that came in and poured the oil. He didn't say, you get everything ready, get everything prepped, and then I'm going to come in, and I'm going to pray over the oil, and then I'm going to pour the oil, and there's going to be a miracle. He said, no, you do it. You do it. And that's when the miracle began to happen. Can you imagine that, that first moment when she has that oil and she begins to pour it? And she's like, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm empty. I'm not empty. I'm not empty. This isn't empty. It's still going. Boys, look at this. It's still going. And then it gets full. She's like, uh, bring me another one. Bring me another one. And she begins to pour in that one. And just the joy, like, can you imagine? Like, I just, I just see them, like, cracking up with laughter. And just the, the joy and the passion in that moment. Why? Because she was available and because she was willing to serve and do whatever it was that she needed to do. And that's where the miracle happened. When you are willing to serve, when you make yourself available to God, and you're willing to do whatever needs to happen, let me tell you something. God begins to work miracles in your life. When you're cleaning a toilet (laughs) in service of the Lord, sometimes that's when the presence of the Holy Spirit comes on you the strongest. When you're doing the things that nobody else wants to do when you're serving, when you're helping a widow or an orphan, you're doing the things that are low, that's when God shows up because that's the heart of God. That's what God would do. That's what Jesus would do. When he got done washing his disciples' feet, he said, I expect you to do the same. That doesn't mean we have to come in every Sunday morning and take off our shoes and wash each other's feet. But he's saying, I expect you to have that attitude. The same attitude that I have. The attitude of a servant. He said, even the Son of Man, the the Lord... (laughs) The creator of the universe did not come to be served, but to serve others. Why? So that others might be saved. (laughs) When you do those things, miracles begin to happen. (laughs) When you do those things, the presence of God shows up in your life, and you'll be more ministered to than anything that may happen here on a Sunday morning. Because that's the heart of God, and that's becoming like Christ. The last one is this in verse 7. After they're all full, after they filled every jar and the oil stops flowing, she's standing there looking like, I don't know what her house looked like, but I just picture like just jar after jar after jar all over the house. And she's got all of this oil. She's like, this is amazing. And she goes and tells Elisha, like she, I could just picture her running to Elisha and tells him what happened. And he says, when she, it says in verse 7, when she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. The last thing that she had to do was she had to be a minister. She had to get it out of the house, right? If that oil had just, like if she had just, poured all that out, and she was like, all right, now I've got jars and jars of oil. I love it. Now I can, I can have oil. It wouldn't have done her any good, right? Like, as long as it was just sitting there, it wasn't doing her any good. The oil always in Scripture, like when you read through Scripture, always represents the Holy Spirit, always represents God's presence and his anointing on your life. And so what Elisha is telling her to do is you've got to take that, what you have been given, what God has poured into you, and you've got to take that and take it to other people now. (laughs) You've got to take that and get it out of your house. It was never meant for just her. That oil was not just for her. That oil was meant for everybody else in the village. (laughs) That oil was meant for everybody else that she came in contact with. See, we have so many Christians that come to church every week, and they come and they sit here on Sunday mornings, and they're poured into, and they begin to fill up with oil, and they just sit here, and the oil never leaves. It never goes out. It never affects anybody else. Now, in a physical sense, this may be a little bit gross, but if all you ever did was eat and never got rid of anything, you'd be a sick person. (laughs) Your body isn't meant to work that way. Spiritually, you're not meant to just take. You're not meant to just eat and drink and be filled up and it never go anywhere else 
out of the house. You're meant to take that oil then and bless your neighbors with that oil. Take that oil and bless your co-workers with that oil. Take the Holy Spirit that is in you and pour it out. We've got to get it out of the house. We've got to get it out of here. That's what we're called to do. In, in 1 Corinthians, let me make sure I get the verse right, 12.7, Paul says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. The giftings, the anointing, the oil, the presence of God that God has given you, that the Spirit has given you, is not just for you, and it's for others. It's to help each other out. It's to build up the church. It's to go out into the world and spread the gospel and to be the light that Jesus has called us to be. This widow, this woman who, who her first response when asked, what is in your house, said nothing Man, except this little bit of oil. Man, think of what God did in her life. Because she made it available to him. Because she was willing to put in the hard work. Because then she was willing to get it out of her house. And not just hoard it herself. As Christians, that's what we're called to do. And one of the things that I feel so strongly about as a pastor is that it's not about me. It's not. Church, the, the, the idea of who we are and what we do is more about you than it is anyone else. As I end, I just want to share this one thing with you. It's something that I found. How many of you have ever heard the, the Greek word for church that's used in the New Testament? It's ekklesia. Ekklesia, maybe is how you say it. I'm not a Greek person. Um, but it's this word. And, and then we have the word church, right? And those two words aren't, like church isn't from Ecclesia. And when you study that out, like in Spanish, the word for church is iglesia. So it obviously comes from that same word. Even in English, like ecclesiastical, you know, when you talk about priestly garments, they're called ecclesiastical garments. So that word kind of exists in the English language, but it's not the same word that we use. And I was like, that's weird. Why? What is, what is this? Like, why, why don't we use that word? Where does church come from? And so I started doing some, some research, you know. That sort of stuff just interests me. I get kind of nerdy with it. But I started doing research at, on church and where that comes from. It comes from an old English word and probably from Germanic before that. But the, the root word is circe, which is the same word where we get circle. It's the same word where we get circus. <laughs> and I thought, man... That doesn't describe the Western church. <laughs> like, we all gather together, and we all watch a few performers. We all watch the ringmaster and the clowns, <laughs> and they make us feel good about ourselves. And we leave, and we're like, oh, that was a good show. Like, I feel good about that. I'm happy. And then we leave, and it has no effect on the rest of our lives. That's what church, in a lot of ways, has become in the Western culture. Let's gather as many people as we possibly can, get them in one place to watch a few people perform so we feel good about ourselves and can li leave and live the rest of our week the way we want to live. Ecclesia, though, <laughs> was almost a military term. And it was meant, that when, when you study the meaning of that word, Jesus basically stole that word and used it in, in his kingdom, in a kingdom purpose. But it means a group of people set apart to accomplish a mission. <laughs> That's who we're called to be. That doesn't mean that, that you have six people who do all the work. It doesn't mean that we're running a cruise ship where you have a crew that does all the work and everybody else is up on the top deck sunbathing. Like this is an aircraft carrier. Everybody here has a job. Everybody here has a purpose. Everybody here has a mission. We're all directed towards one mission. We're all working towards one goal. And each one of us have a job to do to make sure that we accomplish that mission. Over the next six to seven months, that's what I want you to understand, is that we're all called 
It's no longer a priesthood and everybody else like it was in the Old Testament, like you see in the Catholic Church, there, that we're all called to be a royal priesthood. We're all called to be missionaries. We're all called to be ministers of the gospel. And the way you minister is not going to be the same way I minister, just like the way on, a, on, a, on an aircraft carrier, not everybody has the same job, not everybody has the same role, but everybody has to fulfill their role in order for that ship to move. That's what we're called to be. And so this story of this widow who had lost her husband, who was the man of God, who was the one in training to be the minister, God said, no, even in the Old Testament, he said, no, it's not just about him. I can use you where you're at. I can use you with what you have in your house. I can perform miracles through your hands. It doesn't have to be Elisha. It doesn't have to be your husband. It can be you. So that's what I want you to get this morning, is that it can be you. God can use you if you're available, if you're willing to serve, and if you'll just get out of the house (laughs) and do what he's asked you to do. Let's pray this morning. God, help me to (laughs) live out these verses in my life. God, that it's not just about Sunday mornings, but God, that I would, as the pastor, (laughs) lead by example. God, that there are people that may never step foot in these doors, that are in this neighborhood, that are in this city, that need you. And God, you're calling me to reach out to those people outside of these four walls. God, I pray for everyone that is here this morning that, that you would just begin to reveal to them. They may be sitting there thinking, that's all great, but I don't even have a flask of oil. <laughs> Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to every single person here what it is that they do have. God, what it is that they have that can be of service to you. God, whatever it is, you have given gifts to each one of us, to every one of us. God, begin to reveal those gifts to the people that are here this morning. Begin to reveal those giftings and that calling and those things that you have put in their lives that they can use in service to you. So God, I pray right now that you would just touch and speak to their hearts, that each one of them would begin to to realize and make that available to you in the simplest of ways, God, in the simplest of ways to go out and be a minister, to do what you've created each one of us to do. God, that this church would be known as a group of people who are set apart to accomplish a mission. We would not be a circus. (laughs) We would not be a show. God, we would not be a cruise ship. We would be an aircraft carrier on mission, everyone performing their jobs, everyone working towards the same mission, your mission, God. God, speak to each one of us. Speak to this church body. God, guide us and direct us in what we do and what we say. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you guys all for being here this morning. Again, next week, next Sunday, with it being right before July 4th, we're just having the one service, 9 o'clock, here next Sunday. So we hope to see you guys then. Have a great week.